Thank you. Thank you, General Rotten. Thanks, everyone, uh, for being here. So I will talk about uh, the market mechanism in centralized uh, assignments. Uh, just to quickly mention, this is based on two papers, um, and some related work. Uh, one uh, that I wrote with Antonio Miales and Jun Sang, uh, Jun is a former student of ours, and another uh, paper which is very old, um, from 1970 now, by, by Hill and Seckhaus. So uh, the type of problem that I'm interested in is um, decentralized, uh, is, is um, resource al allocation problems. And um, this is a um, family of problems that are central to economics ever from, uh, since it began as a formal discipline. Uh, so we're very used to thinking about uh, using markets to um, um, you know, allocate resources in a decentralized way. So we want to uh, understand uh, who consumes which um, uh, goods, uh, how wealth is allocated in an economy, and how resources um, are distributed and, and allocated. Um, now, if you uh, remember, there's an old uh, and, in a, in a sense, um, uh, uh, d discussion that's over between using markets to uh, allocate resources in a decentralized way and central planning. You know, so if you're old enough, you remember that there was a time where, uh, you know, in the world, you know, there were big proponents of central planning and then big pro proponents of using markets to allocate resources in a decentralized way. Uh, this discussion is largely over, uh, but there are still many instances within a capitalist economy where resources are allocated in a centralized way. You know, think, for example, inside a firm, uh, you, you still have a lot of command and, con and control uh, structures, uh, so centralized assignments are, are central even in, um, uh, within uh, modern corporations. Um, but today I want to talk about some very practical um, allocation problems that are done in a centralized way, uh, even in a, in a uh, capitalist economy, and that we can use ideas from markets to improve on how they are allocated. So I'm just, just gonna mention some examples, and I'm gonna pick some specific examples where Caltech faculty and students have uh, played a role. Um, the, the first one we have not played a role, but nevertheless it's a very well-known example. It's, it's a labor market, uh, which is strange, you, know, you think of labor markets as something that functions in a decentralized way, and you know, workers and firms um, bargain over wages. Uh, there are, however, uh, a few labor markets which are handled in a centralized way. So this is a, a very common example, um, medical interns. So when students in medical school finish um, their studies, they have to do an internship, and the way in which uh, interns are allocated to hospitals uh, is done through a centralized algorithm. Uh, which is called the match or the NRMP. Uh, another example is in business schools where MBA students uh, have to bid and then and buy and sell shares in um, seats in, in courses. So the way in which sc scarcity is resolved in certain business schools for seats in classes is done through a uh, market mechanism. So Wharton is one example. Uh, Another example, which is a bit closer to what we do at Caltech, is uh, organ allocation. So um, you have organs available either through deceased donors or through living uh, donors. You have patients who need uh, you know, transplant of a kidney or a lung or a heart, and you want to resolve this allocation problem. Uh, now, this is a situation where, in principle, ideas from markets could uh, improve on the allocation, but where there's a very strong uh, ethical um, reaction against using uh, money and markets to do the allocation. So then you can do it in a way that is centralized, uh, which doesn't use uh, you know, um, decentralized market, but with, uh, where still some of the ideas, uh, some of the reason for why markets work well can be used in order to design uh, the, the centralized mechanism. Uh, I'm gonna mention quickly two more that Caltech faculty are involved in. So this is the Pasadena Unified School District. Uh, you assign kids to schools, and um, we uh, uh, proposed an algorithm, a way of doing it for the Pasadena Unified, which they have already adopted, and it's in place um, right now. Again, these are public schools, so you're not meant to you know, pay tuition. You, you can't really have a market for these things. You do the assignment in a centralized way, but still you can use some ideas from markets 
um, to, to improve on the allocation. Um, one more I want to mention are prediction markets, which are, uh, have been uh, of interest to Caltech faculty for a, long, for a long time. Here again, you can set up markets uh, within an organization, for example, within a firm, in order to understand better the information that individual uh, participants have. Uh, so uh, Charlie Plot, one of our colleagues, did this for Intel, for example. That's one, one example. Anyway, so I'm going to talk about the, the main ideas which are involved in this type of uh, market design and this type of centralized allocation. Uh, so we'll be talking about assignments or allocations. And that's basically uh, just an answer to the question of uh, what do we give to whom. Uh, as a running example, I want to use, I'm going to imagine that we're going to be assigning office, offices in Baxter. So uh, Baxter is the, our building over there. Uh, there will be agents and resources. The agents are students, staff, and faculty. The resources are offices. And we need to figure out who gets which office. So an assignment is an answer to that question. There are some desiderata that we uh, follow in uh, this type of problem. Uh, the first one is efficiency. So efficiency is an old, very important idea in economics, and I will give you a, a definition very soon of what it means. The next one is fairness, which is a very important consideration, um, especially for policymakers and society in general. Often economists don't think about fairness that much, but we'll, we'll try to think about it today. And a bit later in the talk, I'll talk about property rights. Okay, efficiency. So economists' notion of efficiency is parito optimality, and it's, it's, it says the following, the, the idea is simple. Uh, it says that an, an assignment is efficient if there's no other assignment in which everyone can be made better, better off without someone being made worse off. So if everyone is at least as worse off, off as before and someone is strictly better, uh, then it couldn't have been efficient. So this notion of efficiency basically says that there's no slack in the system. We can't somehow improve on the location without hurting anyone. Okay, that's, that, that very often the very first questions that economists ask when they're looking at a system, at an outcome, you know, is it efficient? And what they have in mind is exactly this. Fairness. Uh, an allocation is fair if there's no envy. So we say that Alice envies Bob at an assignment if she would like to have what Bob got, okay? So in the context of offices, no, there's no envy if no one would like to have the offices of, of someone else. So an assignment is fair if no agent envies another agent. Okay, pretty natural idea of fairness. But if you think about it uh, a little bit, you realize that you know, it's hopeless unless you allow me to randomize. No? So if you're used to the idea of allocating goods, so if you have kids, if you're used to the idea of allocating goods among kids, you know that flipping a coin is very, very useful. And in general, uh, you know, if Alice and Bob want the same office, then we're gonna have to randomize. There won't be any other way of doing it. Now, randomizations might seem artificial, but they are actually very practical. And uh, for example, in the Pasadena Unified uh, example, we use uh, lotteries uh, as a way of allocating schools. So if you have any experience in school assignment, you know that lotteries are very important. And, and they're important exactly for this reason, because because we want to allow for fairness. So if everyone, you know, some schools are better than others, we want to allow everyone a fair shot of getting into the best school, then we use, we use a lottery. I mean, there's nothing, uh, pe people are very uh, used to that idea. So, so economists are, are used to thinking about efficiency, uh, but not so much about fairness. Uh, however, in all these experiences with centralized uh, allocation problems that I've been describing, uh, fairness is very often the main consideration. Uh, in fact, if you ask policymakers, uh, they very often prefer to prioritize fairness over efficiency. Uh, and there are specific examples of you know, offering a menu to a policymaker of an outcome that is efficient but not fair, one that's fair that's not efficient, and they will pick the, the fair one uh, almost every time. So can we be fair and efficient? And in the type of problems that I will talk about today, with the type of problem exemplified by assigning offices, the answer is yes. And you can do it in a, uh, in, in a way that exploits ideas from, from the, our study of markets, and we call them pseudo markets. So the word pseudo is there because we use, use fake money. That's why, that's 
picture of um, monopoly money. So here's how it's going to work. I, I just have one or two equations. This is not uh, a very mathematical uh, talk. Uh, but anyway, this is one of them. So if you have L offices, uh, then a lottery is just um, a an, an, uh, um, probabilistic quantity. So uh, a lottery is this XI, which consists of L numbers, one for each office, and XIL is the probability that I, agent I, gets uh, office L. So that's a way of giving agents uh, uh, essentially lottery tickets. Um, now each agent will have a way of evaluating such lotteries and they are evaluated through a utility function UI. And if you want, you can think of this utility as being the expected value of the lottery. So if I assign a certain number to each office that I may get, uh, and I have a lottery, then I can just calculate the expected value of that lottery, and that, that will be how I value the lottery. Hmm? Make sense? Now, we're going to create a market, a pseudo-market, so we get, you know, people if we're going to do this in this room, we're going to get everyone, all the agents in the economy uh, in this room, so all the staff, uh, students, and faculty. When they come in, we're going to have, you know, Kapawi give them $1,000 of monopoly money. And then when they're here, we're going to create our market, and we're going to assign the uh, lotteries. So there, there will be a price for a probability one of getting one office, and that will be, you know, PL. is a price that I have to pay for getting lottery L with priority one. Now with my, uh, so I'm gonna post some prices here and then with my uh, monopoly money, I'm gonna be buying um, you know, uh, shares uh, in the offices. And these shares will be, will be probability shares, uh, okay? So in this way, each one I will, be, will purchase a lottery and then we'll go and, you know, and stand outside and General Rand here will conduct some complicated randomization scheme by which uh, everyone, uh, everyone's probabilities in the lotus will be uh, resolved, uh, but it will be done in a, in a correlated way so that we ensure that everyone ends up with exactly one, off one office. Okay? So I, ha I have a probability one third of getting one particular office, and Mike has a probability one third of getting the same office. Then, you know, John Ron's randomization skill will make sure that either I get it, or he gets it, or someone else gets it, but we can't both get it at the same time, and also someone gets it. And we will, we'll, each one of us end up with exactly one office. Okay? And uh, there's, there's a way of doing that, which, uh, which makes sense. Okay, very good. So this wouldn't be market if there weren't any equilibria, and, and sure enough, so, so what we'll look at here is market equilibrium. So market equilibrium is when demand equals supply. So here the demand is the sum of the probabilities that each one of us holds. So for office L, I'm gonna sum the probability I have, one third, probability Mike has, one third, probability Lawrence has, one third, adds up to one. So that our demand for that office adds up to one, which is also the supply of that office, because there's one of that office. So we'll look for uh, market equilibrium, which is when the sum of the probabilities equals the, uh, the supply, which is one. And then there's a theorem uh, which ensures that there exists an equilibrium that's efficient and fair. So I can achieve my two policy criteria of efficiency and fairness through uh, the market mechanism. Now, there are ways of doing this which don't involve us explicitly uh, carrying out these transactions. We can basically put the market mechanism under the hood. So I can run an algorithm that uh, obtains this outcome and then I can tell everyone, well, look, this is what you get, these are the lotteries you get. And by the way, you can think of this as being a market outcome at these prices, which is a market equilibrium. And that's, for example, how, how course bidding is done. Okay, so we can achieve efficiency and we can achieve fairness. Uh, now, there's a problem in that usually in market design, the market design is really market redesign so that there will exist already one allocation of offices. And then in order to convince people to participate in the mechanism, you have to guarantee that they are not made worse off. Hmm? So we're going to assign offices in Baxter. We are actually redesigning, reallocating the offices in, in Baxter uh, because people already occupy some offices. So that's what I had in mind when I mentioned property rights at the beginning of my talk. So each agent only has an office, 
And we need to guarantee that no one is made worse off than what they are already with the office they have. This doesn't mean that there won't be incentive to trade because typically there, there will be. Okay? So you know, I may be happy with my office, but there's a particular office that I you know, like better, and there will be someone who is sitting in that office and who is willing to trade with me. So that even if we want to respect property rights, there will uh, still be benefits uh, from trade. In other words, there's no guarantee that the initial allocation that we start from is, all, is uh, all very efficient. But this creates a problem for fairness. So what, what's the meaning of fairness when there are already property rights? So can we rule out envy uh, if we want to respect property rights? So if you think about this, uh, the answer is clearly no. So imagine there's a corner office that everyone likes. So we all want a corner office, and it's currently occupied by someone. Then, you know, either we have to uh, uh, violate the current occupants of the, of the corner office uh, property rights, or we'll have to live with fairness. Sorry, live with unfairness. So live with envy. So everyone will envy the uh, occupant of the corner office, and there's nothing we can do about it unless we, you know, behave like revolutionaries and take away the uh, property rights of the occupant of the corner office. So how can we make sense of fairness in an, uh, in an economy which is a property rights? The, the answer that we propose is the following one. So we're going to uh, justify some envy and we're going to uh, not justify uh, some, some other envies. So uh, in particular, think again of Alice and Bob. And remember that we said that Alice envies Bob's at one allocation if she prefers Bob's assignment to her own. Now this envy will be tolerated, so we'll say it's not justified, only if Bob regards Alice's assignment as unacceptable, meaning that it's worse than his starting point. Okay. So think about it in the following way. So we're going to reassign offices, okay? And when we reassign offices, Alice envies Bob. So she comes to, like, like we often do, we comes to John Around's door to complain, so come knocking. And then we say, okay, you reassign offices, but now, you know, I envy Bob. I would like to get what Bob, what Bob got. So the envy will be, will be um, unjustified if John Around can reply, Look, the problem is that if I were to give you what I gave, uh, sorry, if I, if I were, to, were to give Bob what I gave you, then Bob would be worse off than what he started with. Okay? So that's what uh, envy being justified or not justified means. So the obvious remedy for envy is to switch. So Alice envies Bob, the obvious remedy is to have them, you know, to give uh, Bob what I gave Alice and uh, Alice what I gave Bob. But doing so would violate Bob's property rights. Then I will say that the envy is not justified. Okay? So a fair assignment will not involve any justified envy. And the question now is whether we can achieve efficiency together with this modified notion of, of envy and at the same time um, justifying uh, uh, property rights. Um, I should say that there's there's a very basic idea for why market outcomes are fair. In market outcomes, um, the outcome is fair when all the agents have the same income because everyone has access to the same goods. So in a market equilibrium, if I face the same prices as you face and we have the same income, there can never be any envy because I can just buy whatever you bought. And any differences in envy can only be reflected in income. So. The trick to achieve this will be to construct incomes in exactly the right way. Remember, these are pseudo markets, so incomes are really artificial. I'm giving people monopoly money. So now, in order to resolve this problem, I will need to create incomes in a particular way so that at the posted prices, the only envy that will persist will be the envy that is um, unjustified. And moreover, I would have to ensure that people, uh, property rights are, um, are, are, are satisfied. 
the usual idea, the usual idea for achieving that is that in a market, my income comes from selling my office at the market prices. Then that, that means that I can always buy it back. So I will never be worse off than where I started from because I always have the option of buying back what I started from. And that's an old idea that, you know, if you, whenever you have uh, markets with a starting point, people are never going to be made worse off because they'll ha have the option in the market of at buying back what they started from. So property rights are usually easy to satisfy. But now, when I try to uh, obtain fairness at the same time, I would have to tinker with people's incomes. So I need to make sure that all three things can be achieved at the same time. Efficiency, fairness, meaning ruling out envy unless it's justified, and uh, property rights. And um, so the, the answer is that you, you can do it, uh, but you need to create, um, you, you need to use a mechanism for obtaining income as a function of price. Uh, and it has to behave in the right way. It has to achieve these objectives that I, that I mentioned. Uh, but the answer is, you know, with price-dependent income, if you, if you do the, um, uh, the mapping from prices to incomes in the right way, uh, and you have some assumptions on the utility functions that they are well-behaved, for, for example, the expected uh, utilities that I mentioned earlier uh, will work, uh, then there exists a way of doing this so that uh, you can find a market equilibrium that is efficient and fair, meaning that it has no justified envy, and it uh, respects uh, uh, pro property rights. There's another way of viewing this result, which, is, which doesn't have formal markets, but instead has a utilitarian criterion. So uh, there's this idea, this utilitarian objective, where you maximize agents' happiness. Now, um, you can weigh agents' happiness in different ways. So you can put weights on, on who is, uh, how happy different people are. So you can put weights on the agent's utility functions. And uh, an alternative way of viewing this is that you can find the weights on the utility functions which respect fairness. So in a sense, you want to be, uh, you, you want to have weights that reflect people's starting point. Uh, so you, you don't want to give everyone the same weights because then you will have violate people's uh, property rights. So if you weight people's uh, utilities in the right way so that you reflect the starting point, then you can achieve this objective. 